My name is Allison McClellan. I'm a medical student at the University of Central Florida College of Medicine. I've gotten to meet a lot of great physicians, and the interactions that I've had with these people have got me thinking, what is their life like? How did they choose their specialty? What kind of training did they have to have in order to get where they are today? What does their day-to-day life look like as an attending physician? What lessons do they have to share with me and with other medical students? So today I'm going to introduce you to one of these doctors. That way you can hear their answers to some of these questions and hear what they have to say. My name is Jordan Smallwood. I work in the Department of Allergy and Immunology here at Nemours Children's Hospital. I went to the University of Kentucky College of Medicine for medical school and then went to the University of Louisville Cosairs Children's Hospital for three years of pediatric residency, then directly out of that to fellowship at Medical College of Georgia. And one of the great things about allergy is you can be trained in pediatrics or internal medicine, but in your fellowship, you see both adults and pediatrics. So I finished three years at a children's hospital, and one of my first rotations as a fellow was in our VA hospital. Do you have any kids? I don't have any kids of my own yet. I got a whole hospital full of kids and that's all I can take care of for right now. How do you deal with that when parents ask you that? I think when I get that question, most parents do seem to understand when I tell them, you know, all I deal with all day long are other people's children. And the few that don't, I really make a point when you're in my office of trying to let you know I understand where you're coming from. It's not this position of power that I'm in because I have information you don't. I try to educate my families about what's going on with their child, why it's happening, and what we as a team are going to do about it. I try to listen to them and then repeat back to them whatever their particular concerns are. I come from a position of of empathy, and and I think a lot of families can pick up on that when they're in the office with me. And so even though I don't have my own kids, and I'll readily admit that to them, I can say, I can still appreciate that your major concerns are this and this. While I haven't had kids of my own, I've had the benefit of plenty of other good experiences where I can appreciate where somebody's coming from. So I try to put myself in everybody else's shoes when I'm in clinic. On a day-to-day, what is it like for you? What kind of patients do you see normally? It's a good blend. With immunology, the majority of cases that I'll see are parents bringing their children just because they get sick more often than they expect them to. And a lot of times it's your typical three and four-year-olds who've just started daycare. But, you know, when you have a child who's in and out of the pediatrician's office being constantly put on antibiotics, blaming it on daycare rapidly becomes an bad excuse for what's actively going on, so then they come to see me. I also do have some patients who legitimately do have problems with their immune systems and they're not able to fight off infections and things that are trying to make them sick in the outside world. On the flip side of that, I have allergies, which really encompasses a whole lot of things. I'll see kids who come in for eczema or for hives or for my kid has a rash and I have no idea what kind of rash it is. I'll see patients who have food allergies, patients who have environmental allergies, the traditional things we think about, I get a sneezy, runny nose whenever the pollen count is high. And then the, the interesting things, uh, you know, I was on three different medications and broke out in a rash and I have no idea which one caused it. So it's, it's a big grab bag of things that I get to see, which I actually like. It's what keeps me on my toes. You can go from one train of thought to something completely different the next patient and you really have to be able to react on a dime in order to take care of it. What do you do to try and, you know, put your patients at ease? What I look for in a physician for myself or in the future for my own kids is somebody who's willing to listen. It's the most important thing that any doctor can do. Um, I'm coming with a complaint. I know that you're busy. I can appreciate the struggle of having multiple patients there. Listening to me and really listening for five to ten minutes is invaluable. You don't have to listen for 30 minutes. Just let me know that I have your undivided attention. Repeat back the things that I say so that I know that you actually are hearing what I'm telling you. I don't want your gears to be turning the whole time that I'm talking so that my child can just be another diagnosis and you can get out of there. Understand where I'm coming from. If I'm in your office, it's because I'm afraid something's wrong. Now, maybe there's nothing wrong, but I'm still afraid that there is. I'm a human being, and and being a doctor in another doctor's office is always an awkward experience because, you know, there's this, well, are they judging me? Are they using their medical knowledge? Do they disagree? You're a human being when you're going to see the doctor. That's why you're there. And what you need is somebody who can appreciate just that human experience that we're all afraid. We all want to be healthy. We want to make sure nothing's wrong. And so what I look for in a doctor is somebody who mirrors that back to me, who lets me know, I'm going to listen to you. You are my priority in this moment. My mind isn't in another room with another patient. I'm going to give you everything that I can. Honesty is the other big thing. And that's what I try to do in my practice. If I don't know how to deal with something or I don't know what's going on or I don't think I can help, it's never a comfortable thing to admit I don't know. 
but learn that lesson early to be able to tell families, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on here. I will talk with this doctor. I will read this research paper. I'll do whatever I can to try and get better acquainted, but I really don't know. Families, I think, appreciate a doctor who can look them in the face and say, I'm not sure, but I'll do my best to get to the bottom of it. I'll tell my families, if I'm not the doctor who can help you, then I'll do everything I can to put you in the hands of whoever that doctor is. And it admits that we don't have all of the answers. And I think it helps to put parents at ease on the front end. If parents know I'm going to be completely honest with them about everything, if they can trust that I'll own up to my mistakes, my failures, my you know, the, the areas where maybe I'm not as talented, then when I step up and I do give them a thorough explanation of what's going on, I think they say, well, then we can definitely trust this because he would have otherwise told us. And so that's how I try to show my families that I'm a doctor that they can that they can depend on. Did you have anybody that kind of helped you decide how you wanted to practice medicine and what kind of doctor you wanted to be? No. Um, it's such a terrible answer. No is the answer, but it's only because I can't pinpoint this one person. I don't, I don't look back over my medical career and go, this one person influenced me more than anybody else. When I was a resident, I had no clue what I wanted to, to be. I, I loved everything. I thought maybe I'll be in the emergency department. Maybe I'll be in the ICU. And you can tell, ending up in allergy immunology, I ran the complete opposite direction there. And I love my job, and I couldn't be happier with the decision I made. Uh, I was just so ecstatic to be getting to do a job that I loved, which was just being in pediatrics, that it didn't really matter. And I was also lucky to be at an institution where all the doctors were of the highest caliber. Uh, they were compassionate physicians, they were hardworking physicians, and they instilled that in us as residents. So it's hard for me to say that any one of them shaped me uh, any more than you know, the other. As far as allergy is concerned, the director of my program and fellowship absolutely helped to shape and mold me. Once you got to know him and understand that everything that he would say and do every time that he was critical, it was only because he was trying to help make you a better physician. And I hear myself say so very many of the same things that he said to me. One of the things that used to drive him nuts was if we use the term, uh, a patient's here for allergies, because it's a nondescript term. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean you have itchy eyes, runny nose, a rash? Allergies is just a blanket term for a whole lot of things, and it would drive him up the wall. And when people say, you know, well, I'm here for my allergies, the very first thing I hear myself say is, well, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people we need to break that down a little bit more. So at least I am, uh, I, I'm a little gentler in my approach, but he definitely helped to shape the, um, the way that I am an allergist. So I'll give him a little bit more credit than every other doctor I've ever worked with just because he, um, he really helped me in my current career. But as far as who I wanted to be as a doctor, I've just been blessed with uh, so many good mentors. There's no way to pick just one. So what do you define as a good doctor? And then how does that you know, shape what decisions you make in your practice and what you do? A good doctor is somebody who this isn't just their career. You don't just do this to make money. It's not just, you know, well, I'm a doctor. It's, it's more about who you are, and you've got to bring part of that with you to your job. I can treat your allergies. I can give you medications all day long. That's no problem. I've got that stuff easily. But if I tell you I'm going to call you, I do it. If a family calls me and they're worried I make a point to come back at the end of the day and call them personally and say, you know, I have to imagine that it, it, you were having a rough day. My nurse mentioned to me that you called earlier about this and I wanted to touch base with you personally. And I've done that. And there's probably some times that I have dropped the ball and, and could do better. But a good doctor follows through on that kind of stuff. A good doctor thinks about what the patient can and can't afford and the fact that they will be getting a bill from the hospital for everything that they do. And so if a lab isn't going to change the way that you treat them or isn't going to offer you more information, then maybe we don't get it. They think about whether you're going to be able to get a medication covered by your insurance or you're going to have to buy it over the counter and how much that's going to hit you in the wallet. They think about the kinds of questions that you might be thinking before you even ask. So, well, he has an allergy to this. What I'm pregnant right now. What is my baby's risk of this or that? You know, when I have a mom come in and she's, you know, and she's, obviously pregnant. And of course, I never ask a woman if she's pregnant or not. If she makes that known, then, you know, I, I will say to her, and you might be wondering about your baby. And I've never had someone go, no, nah, I hadn't thought about that at all. Of course, they're thinking about that. So it's not that you just come in, you do your job, you, you know, eight to five, collect your paycheck, go on home. I mean, you've got to be able to have a social life outside of this job. But this isn't just 
what you do for a living. It's it's got to be just who you are, and you you go home at night and you think about the patients that you weren't able to fix, and you read on them and you research them, and it drives you nuts when you can't get somebody better, and you hurt with your patients, and you celebrate with your patients, and that's what makes a good doctor. And one of the things that I love about it is as I continue to work towards becoming that doctor, um, you don't try anymore. You know, I remember when we did interviews in medical school, everything felt forced. You thought, well, I have nothing to discuss with this person who I've never met before. And you would force small talk and questions. And I don't know when it happened, but it doesn't feel that way anymore. I can go in and I can just start a conversation and I can talk with families and for some reason at the end of it they trust me and they listen to me and they are willing to be on a team with me to get their kid better and i have no idea when it happened and you'll find that and and it's a really good feeling when you can just do that and it's just because that's who you are it's who you are in your everyday interactions is turning it off that suddenly becomes the hard thing so somewhere in the midst of all of that mess of an answer is is what i think a good doctor is and what you should work to be and what i really really hope i get to be someday down the road as well